and then the X came along, and I was afraid that that was the rating that was given. <laughs> but now that we see that ideas have sex and, and there's drunken mice, it just makes so much more sense. So I, it's really, it's a pleasure to be here. I had no idea what I was putting together for this. So this is, I hope you guys uh, enjoy this presentation. I'm here to talk about what art therapy is about in my work in art therapy. Now, art therapy, I'm going to try and sum up 53 years worth of art therapy in, in the first five minutes. So bear with me. I'm not going to leave anything out, but I talk very fast, so work with me here. Um, do you know what art therapy is? It, it's, it's therapy with people named art. <laughs> Come on, people. Really, work with me here. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually thinking about expanding my repertoire so I can get more clients. I'm going to start working with people named Drew and Clay, too. <laughs> I get nothing oh, now, but that was set. Now, I'm going to give you the formal definition. What is art therapy? Definition. Basically, it is just a lot of stuff here. You want to go to, if you really want to find out the true definitions of art therapy and all the work that we do, you can go to the American Art Therapy Association website and you find all the new definitions about what art therapy is. But essentially, art therapy is using the materials to uh, conduct art with a specific client base and it's either using the, the final product as a means of communication when words are just not available uh, almost as a catalyst for discussing one's issues and understanding that there might be symbolic meaning in the art that is important to the person that's producing the art, or the actual process of the art making might be therapeutically beneficial depending on the materials that you're using. You're using it to help sublimate and cathart certain, um, certain emotional issues, redirecting uh, violent and aggressive tendencies, and working on building one's self-esteem and, and helping develop control. Now, the, going back to about 65 years ago, the, the original notion was that by Margaret Naumer, who was considered the mother of art therapy, which is it's funny because we don't know who the father was. But <laughs> Mar Margaret Naumer uh, understood that using the final product of the art was to spark insights in the clients, very much related to the psychoanalytic perspectives of dream analysis. Uh, clients were generally adults, and then she had clients comp uh, complete the art piece at home and then bring it in for discussion. And believed to have coined the phrase dynamically oriented art psychotherapy, Margaret actually studied directly under Freud, uh, both Freud and Jung. Um, and so she, she took away from it the psychoanalytic perspective. Another psychoanalytic perspective, but on the other end of the spectrum, see over here we have art as product. You guys are art as product, art as psychotherapy. You guys, art as process. You guys get the fun part. This is where the, the process is used to steer a therapeutic course. No final insight is necessary. Uh, and it's also psychoanalytically based. It's a whole notion of rebuilding a healthier ego through the art process. Uh, mostly concerned with such notions as transference. You know what transference is? It's when you, you put meaning onto your therapist. Uh, you believe that the therapist uh, means somebody specifically in your life, and the therapist uses that to help work through a healthier relationship. They do that with, with uh, the art. You actually transfer emotions and feelings through the art process. But we all know what, what an, uh, a uh, Freudian slip is, right? right? It's when you say one thing and you meet a mother. It, it's very, very similar to this thing. There's also, she's the one that coined the concept of sublimation. Now we know what catharsis is, right? That's when you get all the energy out into the artwork. I mean, catharsis happens all the time. I mean, I'm catharting right now just by laughing hysterically. I'll get start later. It's really kind of personal. But sublimation takes it to another level. Sublimation is where you take that energy into the process and you create something productive out of it. You create something that's socially acceptable. You take that energy and you make something that then can be used as a means of interacting with someone else. And it's, it actually validates the person's emotions because it's accepted from that other person's. Uh, that other person. Clients were generally children with needs and she would have their client actually complete the art piece in the session because the whole notion, it was important to actually watch the client do the art piece. And so along came Eleanor Allman. She was the person I had studied under. Uh, she was also considered one of the pioneers of the field. And she believed that there was a synthesis between the process and product was important. Uh, a good therapist needed knowledge of both. And even more so than the knowledge of both, what ends up happening is the entire field is based on continuum. There's the continuum between product and process. There's a continuum between the structure and the unstructured materials. There's a continuum between structured and un unstructured directives. 
let me be more specific. All of us in here have worked with art materials before, right? Right? Yeah. Right. This is the art department? <laughs> All right. What are you guys teaching them? <laughs> well, you, we understand that there are inherent qualities within the materials that we use. What's that? What? What? No. Listen. Okay. So art therapy is really based on a serious continuum. More importantly than the process versus product is that we understand that the materials themselves have inherent multi-dimensional variables. That they could either be rigid or fluid, they could either be simple or complex, they could either be, and the directives can either be structured or non-structured. And depending on how you mix this up, you're going to work with different clients based on, on the way you provide the art materials. For example, if I have somebody who's who's manic, to, uh, basically manic and boom, all over the place, right? I'm not gonna use something that's unstructured or complex or fluid because there's no boundaries, there's nothing holding them in place. They're gonna be loosening up all over the place. And have you ever seen an art piece done by somebody who's like that? It's, it's, it, it, it's not pretty. And so, and of course, if you're working with somebody who's depressed, perhaps that's the direction you wanna go in. But you wanna start simple. You wanna start getting them comfortable with materials and eventually loosen them up. Right? And then, of course, there's my favorite. And I want to start getting into my own personal work because I think that was what I was actually asked to do. Right? You said, talk about your work. So that's, that's what I'm going to do. Um, I specialize, believe it or not, with um, prison inmates and aggressive and violent people. And that, and that part's actually not a joke. Um, I specialize in working with uh, prisons and working on specific research agendas on the benefits of art therapy in the correctional institutions, which is ironic, too, because we're talking about interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary. Before this, multidiscipline just meant that I would steal the car more than three times a month. My father was ugly. I don't want to get into it personal. But multidisciplinary, come on. Yeah, it's fine. It takes a second. I understand. It's late. There it is. All right. But, so, all the work is actually very much uh, involving a lot of disciplines. I work closely and I borrow the theories of clinicians, psychologists, therapists, but I also work with criminologists. I work with attorneys. I work with correctional officers. I work with the inmates. I work with um, all different types of artists. And ironically, too, is that there's actually, I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a connection between some of us right here. One of my inmates actually had a tattoo on his back of the Leon School District map. So, it was, I was going to get that's where you got the slide. Another one had that you are here, but I don't want to talk about that guy. <laughs> so, here it is. This is what I specialize in working with. Because it's in print now, because it's up on the screen, it's actually true. <laughs> and so, now, back in 1997, a book came out called Drawing Time, Art Therapy in Correctional Settings and Other Settings. I forgot the title of the book. Um, it was written by a guy named Dave Gussack, which is why it's strange I forgot the name of the book. But we said all these things about the benefits of art therapy in prison, but we never demonstrated it. And so here we're also now talking about the crossroads of art and science. Because in order for us to be heard, in order for us to be validated, in order for us to be welcomed with open arms, which is scary in prison, into the, these facilities, is that we had to demonstrate that there, were, were, there, there was empirical changes, empirical data that demonstrated improvements in our clientele that did art therapy services. And so starting in the summer of 2003, we began a pilot study. And then eventually after that, we then expanded it to follow-up studies and control and experimental groups. And eventually we did uh, control and experimental groups with both men and women's prisons. And we demonstrated uh, through a variety of art therapy tasks that, um, that the art therapy was indeed beneficial um, so that you don't get up and leave now. I'm not going to tell you. You're going to have to wait till the end to hear exactly how beneficial it was. See, you're all staying. <laughs> so the subsequent art therapy interventions went from simple to complex, and they were for individual art tasks to group projects. This is very important because you're talking about an environment where everybody is forced to dress the same and everybody is, is objectified through a number, well, you're going to lose your sense of identity within the setting. By losing your identity, you're going to lose your uh, concept of self-worth. Well, the whole question is, so what? They're inmates. They, they, they're in prison. And it's better to objectify them so we can control them better. This might be the case. But we also know that we need to 
create the healthier inmates so that they're more functional in the prison system so that they can survive within that institution so they can be more productive behind the gates. And if that's not enough to convince people that the art therapy and a, and a healthier inmate is important, it's also cheaper because you're not paying for the medication to make them healthier. You're providing uh, them a means of taking care of themselves because once they're inside the facilities and they're, they're healthier, they're willing to work and they're willing to produce and they will actually make more money for the facilities if you want to be cynical about it. So um, we would start with simple to complex individual art test group projects because we wanted to first firmly ensconce in them the sense that they did have an identity. And then from there, we then work towards them uh, getting into problem solving and communication and social interaction and gaining a sense of self-worth and belonging within these groups. So we would begin with the simple tasks such as the name embellishment. Um, these were, of course, uh, very good in, uh, examples of where they would take their name and they would create an art piece out of it. This is reinforcing the, their own identity, but you're also using very simple materials and you're using very structured materials. So you're gaining them a sense of control, mastery over the objects, and you're giving them a sense of, of, uh, of placement. And of course, we would do self-symbols, and there's nothing like having an anarchy sign in, in prison to really tell you who this person is. It's, it, it, it's nice. Uh, then there's the drawn pass, and this is when you would have a group of eight inmates around a table, and they would all add a piece of the drawing, and they would pass it to the right, and they would add something else, and they would pass it. So you both work on individual and group, and there's nothing better than having a, a six foot seven, uh, 700 pound man accept a drawing from someone else and not get ticked off because you just crossed out their tree. I mean, it's kind of <laughs> nice, and you always want to sit by the door. So, but, so the, here they would, and they would construct compositions within the group, and they would see that they actually belong and they could work together. But it would start slowly with the group uh, dynamics. They would work individually, and yet they would be able to all see how they all contributed to the larger piece. All right, so we're still dealing with simple materials, and then it's getting more um, and group dynamic here. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting symbols in this piece. We'll take it apart later. Read the book. All right, white paper sculptures. Um, this is one of my favorite tasks because you're talking about inmates who, um, once they go into prison, they, they have nothing. And in order to survive in there, in order to gain a sense of mastery, uh, you want to make the, the most out of nothing. You want to make something out of nothing. And one of the art tasks I would do with these guys is I would give them all white paper and glue and say, okay, make something out of it. And once they got into it and they realized that nothing, they weren't being judged by the art piece, they would actually begin to construct rather complicated images. And once they all saw that all the pieces were extremely different and they all started from the same place, that's when you start to reinforce a sense of self-identity. That, yeah, they all may dress the same, they all may have the same numbers, but they're all an individual. Same message we're giving here, making the most out of nothing. How do they make the most out of what they have inside? And then eventually you would do the group project, which is the large group sculpture, in which you would have them all work together over three to four weeks. And you would actually have them construct, for example, this was uh, design your, your uh, dream environment. Um, <laughs> so, so they did a prison. But, <laughs> but, but, at, but at least it's their prison. And that, that's what's important. That means a that, that, that's a bad example. Anyway, <laughs> in order for us to demonstrate change, we would give a pre and post assessment uh, before the sessions began and at the end of the sessions and we would do psych evaluations, and then we would also do an art-based assessment. It was called the Formal Elements Art Therapy Scale. And what I love about this assessment is that you're not, you're not assessing the content of the image. You're not assessing the symbolic meaning or the ethereal nature of the piece. You're actually assessing the formal elements, understanding that line gives us information and how they use the line, how they administer the color on the page, how much space they use on the page, how much uh, whether or not the colors were used for what it was supposed to be used for within the, the um, in the image. And uh, Linda Gant had established, uh, collected over 3,000 drawings of what was later known as the PPAT, uh, fancy initials for a person picking an apple from a tree, um, which was the assessment drawing. And she collected thousands of these from a variety of different um, people with various diagnoses. And she determined that you, you would be able to, 
able to see the, the change in the variance of these formal elements from people with schizophrenia versus people with bipolar disorder versus people with depression versus people with organicity and dementia. And by looking at these elements that she was able to standardize the types of images that would emerge. For example, here's the art based pre-drawing of one of the inmates that took part. And in the, sculpt, in, in, in the um, process, this was over an eight week uh, art therapy sessions. And what we see here is a lack of environment. We have a lack of uh, identity. We have no grounding. We have very few colors. And keep in mind, we, we're not teaching them how to do art. We're not saying, okay, this is how you're going to administer the colors. This is how you make a complete person. All they did were, were eight weeks worth of these rather uh, clear directives to have fun with the materials. And here's his drawing at the end of eight weeks. All right, it's considerably different. Now you could say he learned from someone else by looking at what they were drawing. But the point is, is that this drawing takes a great deal more energy than this drawing to complete. This drawing takes a great deal more environmental awareness than this drawing. So even if it's a matter of them learning from each other and how to do the art pieces, they're still gaining that insight. What we then demonstrated through the psych evaluations that we administered, this psychological, psychologically based evaluation, this person received the uh, Beck depression inventory, we did see a considerable decrease in depression. Uh, we also saw an increase in socialization and problem solving. And for more dramatic feature, we have uh, two side by side. We have an additional person here. We see better problem solving, which is one of the elements that we looked at, so more color. So although this was a, a nice drawing, we saw this drawing had so much more going on in it. And the rating uh, was just subtle enough to demonstrate that there were, was significant change. And then, of course, here's another one. So again, we're showing that they didn't learn how to do the art. You can still see it's the same person, just with, with more expensive clothing on. <laughs> okay. So, and then, of course, this guy got really creative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, you didn't want to be near him. But this is when Smurfs go bad. <laughs> and all the here it is. All of the studies demonstrated over the past 10 years that there was a decrease in depression, that there was an increase in internal locus of control, there was an increase in problem solving, and an increase in socialization. Now what we also demonstrated in one of our uh, later studies was that we compared the men and the women. And both the men and the women prison demonstrated uh, a decrease in depression, an increase in locus of control, and yet we also demonstrated that the women showed a greater increase in locus of control, in a greater increase in mood. Um, ironically, though, they all ended at the same level. What the study, studies reveal is that the women started uh, much lower than the men did with depression. And they started much lower with the external locus of control, which makes sense because the women who are in prison, many of their crimes are more, more externally oriented. They're more doing those crimes because of other people, whereas men, even though their internal locus of control is a little bit more skewed, they're still doing it for themselves, which is kind of nice. <laughs> so these are, and if you want to see these, um, oh, what was fun is that this research led to the Arts and Corrections Program, the Florida Arts and Corrections Program. I was asked to chair the statewide initiative to, uh, by the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Corrections, and she had wanted to start instituting a more consistent arts program throughout the state. And what I'm very excited about, like any bureaucratic program, it, it no longer exists. But what came out of that, which I'm very excited about, and I know that's so cynical, but true, um, it lasted for three years. What did come out of that was the Inmate Mural Arts Program, otherwise known as IMAP, which Steve Jobs was trying to sue me because of the letters, but I, I wouldn't let him get away with it. Um, IMAP, of course, is, again, our relationship here with, with Phil. Thank you for letting me use that. Um, and the Inmate Mural Arts Program is where we go inside the prisons and we work with the inmates inside and we have them design and, and put together and plan out and, and eventually um, actually complete a large grand mural. And here are three murals that we've done so far. Um, this one is in Wakulla Correctional Institution facing out. Um, this was done by a team of 12 uh, men and two art therapy interns. That is uh, approximately 40 feet high, uh, 40 feet across and 25 feet high. This is in Colquitt. How many people are familiar with Colquitt murals? Anybody? Nobody? So it means nothing. So <laughs> this is actually in the downtown area where they brought the jail inmates out and they had them working on a building uh, downtown. 
and, and, and only only one inmate escaped. So it was a success. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long, long story, you ask me later. But here, and this is a women's prison where um, Gadsden Correctional, and this is, and I love this piece, this is actually about 48 feet across, 35 feet high, and what you can notice here is this pole was in the way. And so they, they decided they wanted to paint it in such a way that if you, they X'd out, see here's the X again. This is great, because they have an X on the sidewalk, and if you stand on that X, you can look directly and see this. Unfortunately, the X was put there by a woman who's 6'2". Six, six so when I stood there, I didn't see what she did. But, but the night, it was nice. It was still good. She, she took the initiative to do that. She didn't think, but that's all right. And then, of course, if you want to actually download all of these articles, um, I don't know why you would, but if you did, and you want to see all the studies and all the end results, and you want to see all of our theoretical articles and all the stuff that we threw out there about the benefits <coughs> of art therapy, you can go to the website. It's, it's a very clever title of the website, arttherapyinprison.com. I don't have to explain it. And so it's a number of different pages and resources where if you really want to learn about the benefits of art therapy in prison, you can go here. Or if you just wanted to go there and mock me further, just, just you know, leave me a note. It's nice. <laughs> and, um, here we go. Any questions? <laughs> this is actually this is done by one of my um, rather sadistic uh, inmates. Again, I'll tell you later uh, over beer. <laughs> Are we allowed to ask questions? Okay. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Do you have any questions? None. Okay. Good. <laughs> sure.